say when you die your life flash before your eyes knowing that i ask why would i want to get by being an asshole and not make the best out my time with family and friends i stand to possibly never see again kierkegaard said why treasure something that we're born into crying and leave screaming i ask why would you want the final movie that you see a culmination of your memories to be anything less than harmony i hear you hollering yolo what a travesty and fuck the buddha man i don't consider reincarnation a disaster piece perhaps it be that the reason we leave screaming is out of existential joy as the void your life continues i'm reborn crying tears of boy oh something like that man it's been a long motherfucking time since i've actually tried to sit down and rap write some shit whatever the case might be uh what the fuck is up what's good has been a long motherfucking time since our last podcast. It's good to see y'all again, hear y'all again. For those of you who are watching along, what's up? Uh, maybe one day I'll see y'all. The goal is to fucking uh, uh, lucratize this bitch in such a way where maybe I'll even have a live podcast someday. Can you imagine that? People coming out to hear your boy talk without having to sign up for a course to pay for it in the first place. That would be the shit. That is the goal. We're going to keep manifesting that out into the universe. But of course, the only way that that can never happen is if I fucking podcast bro it's been three weeks since my last podcast man i don't know i just uh you know i don't i'm i don't like giving excuses but again like i mentioned in the last podcast it seems as though every time i fucking start this bitch i always got a fucking excuse uh this one for this week is gonna be i've just not felt the creative juices flowing man i'm sorry okay uh generally speaking uh my mind is basically like rush hour at all times from the moment that I wake up till the moment that I fall asleep and in, during the even during the fucking few hours of sleep that I managed to fucking piece together, my mind is constantly racing with thoughts, flight to thought, all kinds of shit, right? But for some reason, recently, the thoughts, I mean, the mind is still racing, but the thoughts just haven't been formulated in such a way that I felt that I would be able to come at you with a grito of any actual significance i just didn't think i had anything to offer you as you know as as a grito listener as a you know instagram video watcher whatever the case might be and because of that i just said fuck it dude i'm just not gonna podcast because i'd rather have complete radio silence than drop some bullshit on y'all motherfuckers you know what i'm saying but even then i was sitting here thinking to myself like damn another day going by with no podcasting i ain't got shit going on i got some free time like what the fuck am i doing in my life i can sit here and read right i can sit here and keep writing some more but at the end of the day i gotta get some podcasting into the mix and one of the things that i have learned from my reading and my writing is that most of the times the creative blocks that i tend to be experiencing are generally because i fucking i started becoming afraid for some reason i'm afraid that uh what i'm writing for instance is not good i'm afraid that uh you know what i'm reading is a waste of time i'm afraid that the music that i used to make back in the day was terrible which kind of was back in the day right but i've gotten better at it just wait i'm fucking feeling to drop that new shit on you one of these days um but also with the podcast like i get up in my head that it's fucking terrible and then i gotta provide you with like the dopest quality shit and i'm not saying that i don't but i'm just saying that sometimes that itself becomes a fucking major a major hindrance i should say in the creative process so i just i said to myself you know what man fuck it fire up the computer turn the fucking camera on and just fucking start rocking and rolling right uh i have all kinds of potential topics for the podcast in the works uh, even though I, you know the creative juices weren't flowing uh one of the things i said to myself is okay instead of you know sitting down and dropping a grito that's a, uh, an amalgamation of your thoughts at any given moment let's let's start to expand it a little bit more so part of the expansion i'm working on a podcast right now with uh, material for to talk about joker movie it's been a while since the joker movie came out right but that shit's a timeless movie in the sense that a, I thought it was a fucking great movie, okay? But B, more importantly, it's timeless in the sense that I think we'll look back on it in the future and we'll see just how it's a pretty adequate, accurate, I should say, reflection of our current society. And despite all the fucking shit vice articles that uh to the contrary i don't think it really has much to do with the you know epidemic of white terrorists that we are currently experiencing here in the united states of america and that to limit it to just that reading does it a complete disservice not just to the movie but more importantly to the, what i believe was the actual actual issue of the movie and there's two of them there's two actual issues the first of which being fucking mental health in america bro i said it from day one i will say it until my last one why study philosophy 
when I can just kill myself instead, right? Suicide is obviously a byproduct of mental health, but as far as the Joker movie is concerned, it wasn't necessarily the suicide, but more importantly, the lack of adequate access to mental health care, right? So that was the first reading that I took from the Joker movie and, you know, to try to limit it to, not to say, to be fair, like I mentioned in the podcast before, you got to be a fucking, there's something wrong in the head of these people who are out here doing the mass shootings. You know, I don't want to use the word normal per se, but mentally healthy people generally don't fucking commit mass murder in that in that type of way right so the first reading that's of importance that i think got you know uh uh, pushed underneath the rug in an attempt to push this fucking liberal agenda is the, the 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 mental health issue right but i think even more importantly and this is the part that i'm going to be really focusing on when i actually do have the lecture completely or i should say the podcast itself completely uh, uh prepared is going to be the class struggle man the fucking bourgeoisie and the proletariat boy i said it before and i'll say it again the waynes got what they deserve dog okay i don't give a motherfuck batman spare me your sob ass story i'd rather be a fucking billionaire with no fucking parents and a poor kid like myself who even though my parents were alive they were basically not fucking around right uh fucking like at around like in the anywhere in the area right so yeah you could spare me all your little fucking what was i oh i didn't have parents going up me neither bitch but at least you were a billionaire so get the fuck over it sad boy right um so yeah, that's kind of the angle that I'm going to be talking about with the fucking Batman movie and more of uh, the Joker movie rather. And more, I'm going to get even into deeper depth how I've just never liked Batman. I've always fucking hated Batman, dude, since I was a little kid. Uh, it became a little bit more apparent to me uh, with the Heath Ledger Joker, why I wasn't a fan of Batman. But when I saw the actual, when I saw the more recent, the most recent Joaquin Phoenix Joker, it made poof, it just crystallized why I fucking hated the Waynes, right? Uh, Batman in general, and the reason is because I mean, fucking Batman is an elite, uh, an elitist, bougie turd, yo, and uh, you know all the values that he's up- attempting to uphold are nothing more than the values that you know these fucking people who own the means of production, who have been able to influence their will, who have built their empire off the fucking oppression and off of our uh, of our people peoples and off of our labor our unpaid wages and shit right they're the ones that got to set the moral code and all batman is doing is enforcing the motherfucking status quo right sometimes we need to overthrow that status quo especially the people at the bottoms you get what you fucking deserve okay the ones at the top because obviously the ones here at the bottom we're fucking struggling with everyday shit and all batman was is nothing more than a fucking a fig a, a gatekeeper to ensure that all those elitist rich bougie turds values kept in place Anyways, with that out of the way, I guess it's a perfect segue into the actual lecture material for today. Oh, shit. You see that little hip hop shit coming out just slowly but surely? I'm fucking with you, man. Actually, before I do get into the actual topic for the lecture for today, I want to just take a quick moment to say what's up to all the fucking followers of the podcast. What's up to all my new followers on social media? Slowly but surely, we're working our way up. The goal, I'm going to fucking make it where they're going to fucking bring me out to your university, to your college to speak. It's just a matter of time, man. I'm working on this hood philosophy shit right now, and I'm going to take that shit global to all the campuses around the world so they can know what the fuck is really good with philosophy from the hood, okay? So slowly but surely, every fucking Instagram follower along the way, every video that you watch, every podcast that you listen to, I deeply, deeply appreciate that shit from the bottom of my fucking soul, boy. So I can't, you know, before I even get into the lecture, I have to, you know, just get that out the way. Let it be known that for those of you who have been following along, what's up, man? I see you. Okay. And I appreciate the fuck out of you. Uh, Furthermore, for those of you who are just by chance happening to tune in for the first time or who have been listening but have not fucking followed, yo, what the fuck are you waiting for, bro? How many times I got to ask you kindly follow your boy on the social media? OG underscore ice nice 13 on Instagram. Everything else, I don't give a fuck. Find it. It's somewhere along the lines of ice nice 13 on Facebook and YouTube. Okay. I would say Twitter, but man, I should fucking got off that shit, bro. Why? Because it's just, it's just a constant flux of information. Sometimes I feel like I'm just like whoop, sticking my head into the fucking into the zeitgeist of the generation and the constant flux of information. It's just too much, bro. I was cycling through my Twitter feed one day and it was just a fucking uh, a never ending stream of fucking uh, dicks and pussies, like actual dick in pussy. Right. And fucking people complaining about uh, Donald Trump. And I said, this is too much. I can't. This is too much pornography and too much identity porn, identity politics, rather, for me to take. I've got to get off this Twitter, this Twitter sphere because it's driving me fucking crazy. Right. 
So, um, yeah, plus aside from that, they're all fucking censoring people and shit, and that ain't fucking cool. But to be fair, so is, you know, Instagram, but I guess their censorship is a little less uh, obvious than the Twitter one. So whatever. I've, it's fucking Facebook, uh, mainly Instagram, I should say, but also Facebook and YouTube for now. Maybe one day I'll fucking jump back on the Twitter and put a block for all the porno that comes up and all the fucking identity politics crybabies that are always up on there as well. Right. Anyways. What brings me to this whole topic about fucking Bruce Wayne and, you know, the elitist bougie turds and how his parents got what they fucking deserved and all that kind of shit, the elitist bougie values is because while I was thinking of potential topics that I could discuss for the podcast, one recurring theme that I noticed that kept coming up was the philosophy of my boy, Frederick Nietzsche. Okay, Nietzsche, Friedrich. I don't give a fuck. Okay, I'm not German. I don't speak German. I'm a fucking American boy, right? So it's Frederick Nietzsche. If you don't like how I pronounce it, whatever. Who cares, right? Pronounce it correctly yourself or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I, I, as I was, you know, pouring through not just the the research necessary to make this podcast for the Joker, uh, but also the other ones that I'm gonna be working on, which is the fucking. Um, Rick and Morty ones, two more days from today, the day that I fucking posting this podcast, November 11th, can't wait, season four, right? Um, the recurring theme that I kept on uh, coming across was this Nietzschean character, which probably isn't by surprise. I've, I know I've said it openly on this podcast many of times, but also in my classroom that Nietzsche is perhaps, that's my boy, yo. Nietzsche is my boy, right? Um, even before I was a Nietzsche head, I... Uh, it's like that Carly Rae Jepsen song that, hey, I just met you and this is crazy, right? The fucking, uh, before you came into my life, I missed you so bad. That part right there, right? That's how it was with Nietzsche. So even before I met Nietzsche, Nietzsche was my boy. I didn't even know I missed Nietzsche until I met Nietzsche and I was like, fuck, he died 300 years before I was born. This is fucking lame as fuck. If he was alive right now, I would fucking be like, yo, Nietzsche, you the shit, dog. And I wish I have nothing more than to fucking study underneath you and learn from your wisdom and knowledge that you fucking uh, that you managed to glean from the world. Right. But unfortunately, all boys dead. And even more unfortunately is when you read about how he felt about his philosophy, this motherfucker knew he knew when he was writing this philosophy that he was just it, it was groundbreaking shit. This was fucking almost, you know, 200 plus years ago. And, you know, this fucking philosophy, he knew then that it was just it was going to shatter the foundation of much of the Western world, which it inevitably did. He went from relative obscurity when he was alive to at the very end of his life. He just fucking skyrocketed in fame. And that shit has not ended since, you know, the early 1900s. He's just if I if you ask me personally, I still think that he's only still he's only still being reclaimed because one of the problems with Nietzsche is that people just don't fucking understand them. And, you know, part of those people was for a long time me. So I'm not trying to put myself on a holier than thou fucking level on this shit. But what I'm saying is that I even though didn't initially understand him, I stuck with him. And I'm not even saying I didn't understand him because of the philosophy, which, to be fair, I also didn't understand him because of the philosophy. The way he writes is very it's very, it's just a weird way of writing, right? Uh, you gotta, it, it requires a lot of already prior knowledge of philosophy to begin with, but it's also very aphoristic. So you gotta know the styles and the metaphors that he's talking about in order to be able to connect the dots, right? And obviously a first time reader, if you're just diving into that Nietzschean philosophy, it's gonna be very difficult for you to be able to do so. So uh, that was part of the reason why I didn't really, I didn't really vibe with Nietzschean philosophy when I first got it. But unlike, or rather, like many other people, I also fell into the misguided belief that Nietzsche was a fucking nihilist originally because the person who taught me about Nietzsche told me he was a nihilist, namely my fucking existentialist professor at the University of Texas at Austin. How dare she, right? She's supposed to be a Nietzschean scholar and she said he was a nihilist. And I was like, what the fuck, right? When I found out that Nietzsche wasn't a nihilist, I said, yo, what the fuck? She lied to me, which now in retrospect, I shouldn't be surprised because that's all most teachers do in these institutional learning facilities. Fuck Christopher Columbus, okay? Fucking from day one to the last one, right? Anyways, um, on top of, you know, being falsely led to believe that Nietzsche was a nihilist, I also, for some reason, honestly believed that Nietzsche was a fucking Nazi and that Nietzsche was a fucking, uh, that he hated women and all kinds of other shit that most people generally ascribe to Nietzsche, which... You know, I was a fucking undergraduate in 2010. So fucking almost 10 years later, I'm only now realizing that everything that I believed about Nietzsche, including his philosophy, 
was basically wrong. It wasn't until I started, I you know, I rediscovered, if you will, Nietzsche a couple years ago. And in the past two years, especially, Nietzschean philosophy has fucking just really taken a hold. And honestly, I should qualify it further as I've done before previously in a podcast when I'm just discussing philosophies and philosophers in general, but it's not even Nietzschean philosophy, bro. It's just ideas about the nature of existence and reality that have been filtered by way of the author that we refer to collectively as Friedrich Nietzsche, right? It's insights that this particular subjective human experience of reality gleaned from all the suffering and unhappiness and joy and fucking euphoria that he experienced in his brief and fucking pain-filled life, man, right? So what I mean by that is uh, these ideas, they're, you know, the, the good thing is that we have a Nietzschean character uh, that was able to write this philosophy down and was able to, in such a beautiful way, no less, right? Uh, he was able to demonstrate it to be such an iconic figure, that fucking mustache, man. Like, that shit's iconic as fuck, right? Um, but there's no question that people like Nietzsche existed long before Nietzsche was even born. And there's no question that people like Nietzsche existed while Nietzsche was alive. And there's absolutely also no question. Why is this shit telling me four minutes? I don't know what the fuck is going on. I might have to pause this bitch and come back and start anew. Oh, I know what's going on. Apparently, my camera's running out of fucking uh, video space, which is really annoying. Because it's supposed to have like fucking 120 something fucking megabytes. So I guess uh, I'm at that point now where I'm running out of juice. So rather than be left uh, video less, let me pause this bitch and then fix this. And then I'll come back and we'll start again. So break. It's just my brother cruising now, perusing by. Drove smoke, got us navigating through a lucid high. Then we just cruising. By the guys of the street lights, listening to hustlers music when nostalgically I start to think. Damn, I miss home when our scientists can home time traveling. Send my ass home to the future where I belong when I realize that at any given moment, we're back. More raps. I'm telling you, just been practicing. It's just a matter of time before I re release this fucking CD because. It don't even matter if I fucking sell one or 10 billion, bro. I just want to make the motherfucking music. I listen to hip hop music all the time. And I'm like, damn, that shit is dope. Or as the young kids are saying now, that shit smacks. It's a lesson that I was taught by my high school students recently. Uh, anyways, the point being here is that that's just for the expression element, bro. I just love to express myself. Uh, speaking of expressing myself, express yourself. This podcast, another pl platform in which I've been doing so. And honestly... I got to take a second to humble brag and pat myself in the back because if it was about five months ago, six months ago, however the fuck long ago it was when I started doing this shit and that little technical difficulty would have emerged, I would have fucking completely lost it. I would have had no idea what to do and it would have caused me a fucking massive headache and hour upon hours upon hours of fucking just trying to stitch together the podcast and salvage it in such a way that I wouldn't have to fucking scrap it entirely. But through the process of trial and error, DIY or die, I managed to figure it out unless, well, I didn't even figure it out. I figured it out pretty quickly, but I managed to take care of it in less than about 10 minutes, which is fucking awesome. So pat on my back, right? Uh, and by the way, I'm not just introducing it for no fucking reason other than it actually has plenty to do with the point I was talking about before I fucking left off. And that is the Nietzschean philosophy. There's this great quote by Nietzsche that states, he who has any why can endure any how. The how that I had to do endure here is just trying to figure out what the fuck, how to do all this podcast shit in the first place, right? Something I always wanted to do. And rather than just fucking sit around and let it come to me, I went out and got it myself and I went through his fucking long process of trying to figure this shit out, which bit of trial and error because this is not the first time it's happened when my fucking camera runs out of juice and all that kind of shit where I got to split the fucking video and audio. I would have flipped the fuck out and it would have just been very anxiety and stress inducing. But now, psh, cool as a cucumber, baby. Back to the fucking point that we were that I was trying to talk about before my camera fucking decided to shit the bed. And that was the Nietzschean philosophy, man. I'm just glad this Nietzschean character exists, right? The way I see it now, because from the Nahuatl teachings, right, is it's all one, bro. This is dynamic. It's this fucking this dynamic unity, okay? It's all, it's this fucking monism. It's just one. It's just the one sacred energy, the Teotel, right? The process of becoming. And that everything in this existence is nothing more than a manifestation of Teotel. So what we have here in this Nietzschean character is this fucking 
genius, fucking outright genius insights into reality, the nature of existence that were contained within this fucking individual that we collectively refer to as Friedrich Nietzsche, right? As one of the audio books that I listened to back in the day. So pompously went out of their way to keep calling, referring to himself as, right? Referring to him as, right? So, um, sorry, brief moment, text messages uh, from my girlfriend, right? Anyways, uh, the point here being is that this fucking Teotel energy manifested itself in this Nietzschean character. So, on the one respect, I'll, you know, I'll give him his big ups, right? I'll let him, let it be known straight up. Like, yeah, Nietzsche's a fucking genius. But at the same time, I don't want to discount the existence of all the other Nietzsche's out there who simply just didn't have the fucking luxury. And I don't even want to say luxury, man, because doing so is going to completely shit on the fucking legacy of Nietzsche. But, um, for reasons that we'll see here shortly, but, uh, you know, they just, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't rescued. They weren't salvaged, whatever the case might be. Anyways, getting back to the actual philosophy itself, this Nietzschean character, bro. Uh, one of the biggest things that, you know, he, like I mentioned before, the little break, he gets accused of being a Nazi. He gets accused of being a nihilist. He gets accused of being a fucking woman hater, all of which are fucking basically wrong. All right. The woman hating one is like, little, little, maybe just a little kernel of truth to it, but it was more like, uh, three of them in particular, his mom, his sister, and then Lou Salam, this lady that he fell in love with. Right. Uh, so I can say for sure those, because, well, you know, I don't want to say hate because it's just, he had really like awkward relationships, if anything with them. Right. I don't I never met the motherfucker. I don't know what he was actual thoughts were. I just know what other people, you know, have read and written about him. Anyways. Um, when we read Nietzsche, it's important to know, first and foremost, that it's intended to be read with an understanding that realistically what he's doing is he's kind of projecting his own solitude, man. He's so he, he's projecting his own solitude in the world. This dude knew in fucking, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s before he passed away that he fucking had dynamite. He was dynamite, right? He fucking knew that what he had was special, as I, as I qualified before. And the unfortunate part is that he lived in a society where they just weren't ready to hear what he had to say. They just, you know, they finally found out in the most, oh, the most tragic twist of fate. By the time that he was dying and he was already fucking basically in a vegetative state, they finally, the world finally came around to acknowledge that, you know, he, they finally gave him the, 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 the acknowledgments that he desired his whole life, by which point I was obviously too late, right? Um, but, when he was writing this philosophy, that's what he's, he, that's what he's doing. He's projecting his own solitude as this person that comes into this world with these fucking insights, develops these insights into this world. And he's just looking for someone to share him with, bro. Uh, and one person that he honestly felt that he had finally found that would be able to do so was this Lou Salam character, this lady that he fucking fell in love with. Right. And unfortunately, you know, uh, she just did not, she didn't reciprocate his 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 feelings, which is fine, you know. This idea, you know, being stuck in the friend zone—that's some highly se uh, uh, sexist, chauvinistic shit. Like, yeah, you could be friends with women, dog. Chill the fuck out, right? But I'm sure he would have ideally had, you know, uh, in his mind, envisioned that he would, you know, that she would be his significant other if his biography is to be believed, right? Anyways, I'm gonna put this this way so you can see exactly what it is I'm talking about. This book right here. Right. Uh, but that, that, that when we read Nietzsche, we definitely got to keep that in mind. Furthermore, we also got to keep in mind that he's writing again in this very aphoristic metaphoric style. So people like to imagine, for instance, that when he speaks of the blonde beast, that he's speaking of the German Reich, because unfortunately, his writings were co-opted by his sister and turned into essentially Nazi propaganda. But and it's not what he's talking about, man. In fact, Nietzsche fucking hated Nazis. The, the, they weren't around when he was, by the time he died, they, were, they weren't even around, right? But the idea of, uh, of extreme ethno-nationalism was, but that should have been around since the dawn of time. And Nietzsche knew exactly what the fuck he's talking about when he said, this is not good. Ethno-nationalism is never good. In fact, ethno-nationalism is fucking the result of the death of God, which well, not in this particular lecture, but in, in forthcoming lectures, I'll definitely get into in further, uh, podcast rather, I'll get into in further detail. Um, in fact, Nietzsche was this very uh, cosmopolitan person. He considered himself, most importantly, to want to be a good European, if anything. In fact, I think, uh, uh, I don't think, I know for an absolute fact that one of uh, the, the, the greatest sources of pride for him was that when he died, he died stateless. There was like this weird issue that happened where he was going to go work, I believe, in Vienna somewhere, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I didn't do any of the research. I'm t off the dome, bro. Right. 
But uh, anyways, the point is that he had German state citizenship. And uh, in order to get the appointment for where he was going to go teach, he had to renounce his German citizenship and then gain citizenship to the country that he was going to move to. And somewhere along the mix, there was a fucking they, they fucked it up and he just died stateless because he was not no longer a German citizen. But the paperwork was never filed to make him a citizen of the country in which he was going to go become a professor at. So because of that, I mean, that was like a great source of pride for him. He, you know, this person who vehemently rejected the idea of statehood in the first place. So all these fucking dumb, de- all these dumbasses that you see walking around like, you're proud to be an American, bro. You're proud that you got shot out of a woman's vagina on a fucking arbitrarily defined patch of dirt. Calm the fuck down, all right? There's nothing special about that shit. You could have just as easily been born in fucking Central America, and your ass would have been like, I'm proud to be an El Salvadorian, bro. No, you're proud to have been shot out of a vagina on that piece of dirt and those predetermined fucking lines and all that kind of shit. There's nothing There's nothing inherently valuable about fucking being born in the country you were born, and that's the whole, which is where this Nietzschean philosophy is inevitably, inevitably going to lead us to when we start to discussing the, like the master slave dialect and all that kind of shit masters make their own fucking meaning and purpose slaves inherit and they gladly take over the meaning and purpose that has been bequeathed upon them by something as fucking arbitrary as where your mom was when she went fuck when she had you right so that's another way that we got to read this Nietzschean character we got to see him as this as this wandering figure. He considered himself this fucking this wandering figure who is forever distant from the very mankind that he claims to love. Right. This is very arrogant and pompous language. It's a critique that's leveled. It's uh, it's it's hurled at Nietzsche quite often. The idea that he's that he's an elitist. And, you know, to be fair. Maybe he is an elitist or maybe the people who are, uh, you know, accusing him of being an elitist. That's just their way of fucking getting a Nietzschean character to, you know, come down to their level because he is a such superior fucking. I, I mean, I'm not even going to pull no punches with this podcast, bro. I'm just going to fucking I'm gonna, you know, straight. I'm going to call it like I see it, bro. Uh, it's these people who, you know, recognize the superiority in the character of, or at least in the philosophy of this Nietzschean individual, and they're going to seek to fucking bring him down to their level. At least that would, that that's his reading via the master-slave dialect, right? So elitist, maybe, or maybe you need to step your motherfucking game up and understand exactly what it is that he's fucking talking about before you open your fucking trap, right? Anyways, um, one thing that is for sure is that especially through his Zarathustra character that becomes basically it's him and this weird fucking it's this weird like fucking idealized version of himself right in the book thus spoke Zarathustra but uh what he's trying to do is he's trying to teach if you will mankind but at the same time he's simultaneously afraid that he's going to be considered holy for it which again obviously with the example of the iconic mustache that I gave you earlier, it's kind of what's happening. You find this Nietzsche, especially among the fucking dumbass alt-right people who if they ever took a second to actually fucking read Nietzsche, they would realize that he fucking vehemently would still to this day, I'm assuming, be entirely against everything that it is that they stand for. Sorry, I'm trying to turn up the bright. I got to get the lighting down correctly for those of you who are watching along on the uh, on the YouTubes and aren't just listening to this. I got to get the lighting down in my room, especially now that winter's coming. Right. It's getting a little bit darker. Anyways, all these fucking jerk offs and the alt right and, you know, conservative Nazis and all that kind of shit that use him as, the, as Nietzsche as their fucking messiah. No, bitch, you're just dumb and you don't fucking understand what Nietzsche's talking about. Right. He doesn't want to be celebrated as his martyr type figure. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, that's exactly what, 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 what winds up happening. We have this. He, he ends up being, you know, celebrated and worshipped for the worst of fucking reasons. Right. Um, and most importantly for defending these principles which he himself openly stated were repulsive like nationalism ethno-nationalism no less right um and because of this uh generally speaking uh, throughout the course of history uh western philosophical history he's received this very fucking mixed treatment in philosophy ever since he's di- ever since he died and that's why earlier i qualified it by saying that still to this day even though it's been something over 200 years he's still like this very controversial figure in ways that many philosophers, they're just, we could fucking only hope to one day even, uh, even approach the level of, of infamy that this Nietzschean character does. Right. Um, but the most typical way that this has been, that this is leveled at him is when people are trying to critique Nietzsche, they do so in a way of attempting to, uh, this is how we're going to circle it back into the Joker, uh, uh, reference from earlier, earlier, they seek to dismiss him by simply, you know, calling him a fucking madman. And there's no question that, you know, he did fucking go crazy. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Right. 
um, at the end of his life, he, his father had suffered like they, they, you know, they say that if he was alive now, they probably would have diagnosed him with brain cancer. His dad went out the same way and then he inevitably went out the same way as well. They called it softening of the brain back, you know, in his time. But the point is that by the end of his life, he had just lost his grip with reality. And honestly, the story of him losing his grip on reality and how he talks about it, it trips me out sometimes, man, because there's this great section where he talks about in, in either a book or a journal. I can't recall off the top of my dome, but there's this great section where he's talking about how if if sanity is the is the risk of losing his sanity is the risk that he has to pay for, you know, achieving all these great insights that he did throughout the course of the life and uh, of his life rather that that was a price that he was willing to pay because fuck it why not bro right it's a it's it's high risk high reward like uh the pink floyd song you reach for the secret too soon right that 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 that's what that impression that i got when i'm reading this fucking niche and character talking about like dude i am basically flirting with fucking insanity at the moment but every time that i get into these fucking ecstatic states of being i come back with this fucking philosophy he was very uh easily susceptible to lightning and shit which is like a, a sign of schizophrenia right but uh he felt very empowered whenever there was lightning storms and shit and he says like yeah dude i'm on the brink of fucking insanity but i'm coming back with some genius shit and for most people they actually use that against him. They say, man, this ain't shit, but the ramblings of a fucking madman, bro. And the right, the, the writings are just a product of some fucking asshole that's lost his fucking marbles. And they're fucking, you know, this, this person who is, you know, allegedly grandiose vision, or well, not even allegedly, but this grandiose vision of himself and of his writings, when in reality, it's, you know, not even philosophy at best. This is a critique that is often leveled at Nietzsche still to this day, but especially when he first, you know, when he first burst onto the scene, as far as like, you know, the academic philosophy circles are concerned, right? Um, and then it doesn't help that on top of all of that, there's no question that he had some fucking undeniably strong views about the inequality of men, right? He's going to straight up say, right? And it's not even about ethnicity. Like I, I already mentioned it before, but it bears repeating again. This is the dude that openly spoke against ethno-nationalism. So the inequality that he's speaking of has fucking, it has nothing to do with ethnicity, man. The inequality that he's talking about is uh, it, it, it's men as un, being unequal by nature. But honestly, bro, like, what the fuck? Let's be honest with ourselves. How am I going to compare myself as a basketball player to LeBron James? It's fucking irrational. There's no way. LeBron James is a fucking freak athlete. 6'8", 250 pounds. Can fucking run like the breeze and fucking jump 40 inches in the air on the drop of a dime. I could never, I mean, I could try to do that. But I will never be able to grow to be 6'8". You know what I'm saying? Like some people are just born freak fucking genetic specimens. Some people are just born insanely, absurdly talented when it comes to fucking math, when it comes to playing the guitar, right? Some people are just born good fucking looking. And sometimes, sometimes, very rarely, some people are born with all of that all at once, right? We're talking here like the Tom Brady's. We're talking here like the fucking Chris Brown, people who are born amazingly talented and good looking. They just fucking straight space, bro, all through life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and then there's other people who they just get the shit roll of the dice the entire way. And it's, it is what it is. Like, how are we going to say that those people are equal to one another? They're just not. You know what I'm saying? And this is something that's very fucking prominent in this Nietzschean writing. And it's also another reason why he's so taboo and especially these very left very left leaning uh, liberal circles where everybody's equal and it's all about equality i'm not saying that it's not and i'm not saying that we're in terms of rights aren't equal but in terms of you know human capabilities there's no doubt that we're not fucking equal and you know maybe that's not entirely a bad thing okay but of course, from there, you can extrapolate and see how the alt-right and these fucking Nazis would, they would latch themselves onto this Nietzschean philosophy, this Nietzschean character as a means to, as a, as a, as a, as a, a vehicle by which to deliver their fucking shit propaganda, right? Uh, whatever the case is, and returning back to this Nietzschean character, we should also, when we read it, when we're listening to it, as we follow along the progression of this podcast series, right? It needs to be understood that it's predicated, his writings, on the prescription to shape one's character like a work of art. That's one of the beautiful things about Nietzschean philosophy for me personally, I think, as a fan of aesthetics, as a fan of art in general. That's why I keep fucking freestyling. Not freestyling. That's a rap that I wrote like fucking 10 years ago, right? But uh, it's it's quite obvious that uh, art, like many other people in my life, is of very high importance. And the same was fucking true for Nietzsche, 
right? He's an esthetician in the highest sense of the world, in the, uh, of the word, in the sense that he wanted to make his life and inspire others to make of our lives like a work of art and not live, not and rather to live not only as an artist, but as a work of art as well. Like, damn, bro, as someone who's a martial artist, for example, this shit resonates deep it resonates deep yo because i'm on the mats for instance i like to do jujitsu for those of us who those of you who are listening and don't know me personally uh i like to do jujitsu you know what i'm saying and when it comes to jujitsu when i'm on the mats there's one of two ways that it usually goes down the first way is i'm getting my fucking ass whooped and i'm just trying to survive which is like the first five years of my jujitsu journey and it, the second way is I still got my ass whipped now. Don't get it twisted. But I, I uh, for the most part, I can, you know, I, I can I can swim a little bit better. Like the, the ground is my ocean. Right. I can swim a little bit better in the ocean now. So uh, on the opportunities that I do have when I'm fucking rolling, I'm like, OK, I'm swimming pretty comfortably here. It's just like it, it becomes less about trying to survive and now more about just expressing yourself as an individual through these fucking flows and movements and combinations and you know making an actual art out of it there's no mistake there's no fucking accident as to why jujitsu i believe is referred to as the archi suave right the the smooth art for in brazilian you know what i'm saying like it's uh it's the highest expression of oneself and this is another thing that is very actually prominent in now what's philosophy i must 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 interject is the flor encanto you know what i'm saying the the uh the the songs that you know as a way art as a way this practice that allows us to connect with the most high the hotel in this particular instance it is this instrument that allows the energy of the sacred energy of the hotel to flow through us so when i'm on the mats and shit you know it's just like oh bro you get to fucking relax and be free and let shit happen maybe it'll work maybe it won't work who the fuck knows but let's go for it because you know we're allowing the sacred to flow through us and in so doing creating this beautiful Beautiful fucking painting in this one role, right? And then you extend from jujitsu to every other fucking facet of our lives till we have this fucking, uh, hopefully, beautiful painting that we've created and say, yo, that's my life right there. That shit's dope. Like, I can look at this and be like, fuck, man, I made that. Like, this wasn't given to me. I didn't come to this earth with any meaning and purpose. I fucking, everything that, that is here, like, that's because of me, the good and the bad. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't just take credit for the good. It's good. That's what we're going to talk about when we get to this Nietzsche and philosophy even deeper through the lectures, uh, the podcast series, right? Uh, but yeah, it's not just a matter of fucking the it's it's amor fati, baby, the good and the bad, right? Like, there's just so much to get into, but let's just keep going along the fucking the the notes that I've uh, prepared for today, just so we don't get too far off track, right? So yeah, we're trying to. Uh, oh, here we go. There's Nietzschean quote that I share. Well, I want to share with you all. I'm convinced that art represents the highest task and the truly metaphysical activity of this life. Like again. The, the role of art and aesthetics coming into, you know, in, into play in his philosophy with the goal being then it would at least appear is uh, the importance of reclaiming our lives from the forces that seek to marginalize a man and no force more important than these fucking historically oriented teleologies. Now, I've said it before, the definition of teleology, but just in case you're listening for the first time, this could be a standalone podcast and I'll just straight up reference it again and say that uh, a teleology is just a fancy way of saying an end goal. So when we say historically oriented teleologies, what we're saying is these fucking, these stories that, uh, you know, these historical stories, these these readings of history more, more appropriately that have in them this inherently built arc of where all of it's going to end so the best example that i can give you is christianity christianity is the teleology one of redemption it's built into the story that you know inevitably whether it be in life or through the second coming that the individual or the collective group of people will be redeemed through this christ-like figure right so everything that happens in in in, in the human world is read in accordance to this teleology. So when your fucking best friend dies of 22 at cancer and your grandma says, oh, Miko, well, that's just what God wanted, right? That's a historically oriented teleological reading of the world, which, you know, to tie it into the last lecture, you'll know exactly, or the last podcast, right? For those of you who uh, listen, you'll know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about, okay? This is terrible. This is a terrible way to fucking view life because for one, it assumes that there even is a teleology, that there even is a meaning and a purpose, right? 
for two, whatever meaning and purpose that there is, it's one that's arbitrarily fucking uh, settled upon by the people who are in positions of power, right? So the victor's narrative, if you will, the United States of America gets to decide what the teleology is, which is very convenient for, you know, white European, affluent, wealthy, landowning, heterosexual, uh, uh, able-bodied men here in the United States of America, historically, especially, right? But it's very inconvenient for everybody else. So say you find yourself to be a person of brown coloring of black coloring right? this is fucking ethnicity bro mexican black whatever a person who is not any of the aforementioned that i just talked about right um these historically oriented teleologies they're not in our fucking favor bro because they say that you know mexicans are nothing more than x y and z that black people are nothing more than x y and z and that that x y and z it limits the potentiality of what you as an individual person of either Mexican, black, you know, Asian, whatever descent it may be. And then if it, it, it puts you in this box and it says you can't be anything outside of what's in this box. Right. And, th and it's not even just ethnicity anymore, man. Now we're talking even shit about like uh, just by virtue of being an American citizen. We're fucking again, just by virtue of where our mothers were when they shot us out of their vaginas. Right. They're saying this is what you are and this is what you have to be. And if you try to deviate from this in any way, shape or form, you're fucking un-American, you're unpatriotic, you're e whatever, man, fucking all nonsense. OK, these historically oriented teleologies are doing nothing more than marginalizing our lives and seeking to strip away from us any potential of what it is that we may be and what we may become. And for Nietzsche, this is the fucking thing that we got to stand up and revolt against the most. He's like, fuck that. I'm reclaiming my life from these forces and making of it this piece of art that I wanted to become, not what other people wanted to become for me, right? And so with that sense, this idea that life is subservient to historical forces that lead us to our current situation right? We, we're, it frees us and it gives us the ability to move beyond them and says, yeah, you know what? This is, this is one part of the Nietzschean philosophy that a lot of lefty, especially those of, you know, Mexican and I'll even venture to say probably even, uh, uh of, uh, of black, uh, uh, the black pe uh, the black population in America's right. But definitely I can speak with absolute certainty of the fucking Mexican communities, the people, the, the Brown community in general, the victims mentality, bro. Uh, it, I think it's very detrimental to our overall aims of uh, of sovereignty, right? I mean, part of us, I understand the desire to be like, oh, I'm the I'm the reason I'm here is because of the conquest and the cataclysm and the Holocaust that was induced by European colonization. Okay, no question about it. But just because the the fucking Spaniards conquered the Nahuatl, the Aztec specifically, five hundred years ago, that doesn't mean that the best can, the, that the fucking best option that you have. I'm talking to specifically here, for instance, about the people that I that I grew up with, is to end up a fucking drug addict, alcoholic, in prison, gangster, fucking high school dropout. Like, no, dude, that's the victim's mentality. You're allowing these historically oriented teleologies to fucking dictate what you are and what you can become. For those that didn't fall victim to that. I mean, just because our ancestors no doubt suffered through his cataclysm doesn't mean that I personally am fucking a victim. Like I have the fucking means and the power within myself to overcome. Yes, even 500 years of oppression, there might still be obstacles in the way of me doing so. But it doesn't mean that I should be fucking uh, 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 I should just lay lay over and allow these historical oppressive forces to fucking strip uh, any potential meaning and purpose from my life. Like, fuck, no, dude, that's that's the fucking victim's mentality that he's trying to say that you got to reclaim your you got to reclaim your life from these forces, bro. Right. So uh, in accordance to this Nietzschean philosophy, then at least the goal is going to be for all of mankind. Uh, it's it's not it's 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 just going to be to try to make us realize as a human as a collective human species is that until we let go of much of this I'll, I'll call it the victim's narrative but i'll say more specifically also the slave mentality that we're going to be we're going to settle for this this base level existence when we're clearly capable of so much more that we need to just evolve if you will as a species to what he's going to refer to as perhaps his most problematic fucking idea and that is that of the Ubermensch, right? Which, of course, if you know, if you're believing anything that I've told you thus far, you should definitely believe that that itself gets a really bum rap, right? Anyways, before we get to any of all that kind of stuff, I'll continue a little bit more with some of this introduction here, and I'll simply state that if anything, in regards to history, that the only thing that it really does is it just shows it's what he would refer to, or what Nietzschean uh, 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 critics, not critics, but uh, authors have referred to as this 
panorama of stupidity and suffering, right? Uh, that's such a beautiful phrase. It's such a beautifully eloquent uh, phrase. A panorama of stupidity and suffering. It's just this fucking front row view of all the fucking stupid shit that we as people have done since the fucking first homo sapiens stood up, looked around and said, I am going to oppress people, right? From that moment, all the fucking stupid, barbaric, nonsensical shit that we have done as human beings that has led to suffering, all of it predicated on our base level animalistic instincts. So when we talk about evolution, that's what he's referring to. He's saying, man, we got to evolve past this fucking primal being and become something greater, something more than just this fucking base level human, right? We got to overcome all this fucking, the panorama of stupidity and suffering, okay? And unfortunately, thus far, we've yet to be able to. And because of that, we have, again, to reference this panorama of stupidity and suffering, which illustrates how far away we are from achieving the desired goal of overcoming our current condition. So this, I mean, just to just to uh, tie it in with a little bit of the material that I've discussed thus far in the podcast, the best way that I can put it for those of you, especially who listen, uh, who are listening and do martial arts, specifically jujitsu, it would be like achieving a black belt, bro. Uh, there's one of two ways, and I really learned this, especially within the last two years, right? But uh, I really learned this um, when it came to when it came to my initial attitude, I guess, if you will, towards attaining a black belt, because it's obviously the goal for everybody who steps foot into a fucking jujitsu academy. You know what I'm saying? But I realized that for the first five years or so, my mentality was predicated on focusing strictly on the black belt. And I became, I, I started to realize that in, in, in looking towards the black belt, I wasn't really focusing on all the shit that was happening leading up into the black belt, right? So what I mean by that is that, yeah, inevitably, if I stay on the mats consistently enough, the day will come when I do, in fact, get the black belt. However, that isn't necessarily the progress, right? The progress doesn't come in attaining the black belt. The progress comes in the realization that how far it is, for instance, how about the, uh, just to delve deeper into this. Right now, I'm fucking at a point where I can comfortably tap like a blue belt. If someone is a blue belt, I'm like, I could comfortably tap this person. A white belt, fucking forget it, right? At will if I wanted to. But the goal, the, the, the joy, the pleasure doesn't come from knowing that I can tap a blue belt, let alone a fucking white belt. There really isn't any joy or pleasure in that, right? I'm not saying there's no joy and pleasure. Like I enjoy choking the shit out of people, period, right? But um, the real joy the real joy comes in knowing that if I stay consistent, if I continue living my life as this work of jujitsu art that I hope for it to become, the day will inevitably become, or rather the day will inevitably come when I'm choking fucking black belts as well. And that's where the real joy comes from. That's where the real motivation comes from. Before I was motivated specifically just in getting the black belt because I wrongly assumed that getting the black belt would mean that I've completed the journey, but that's not the fucking, that's not even the right journey and let alone the right attitude, the real journey is recognizing what is inside of me that needs to be overcome in order for me to get to the point where I am comfortably tapping black belts the way that I am comfortably tapping white and blue belts. You know what I'm saying? And that's kind of what he's talking about where he's saying how far we are as a human species from achieving the desired goal of overcoming our human condition. We like to look around and be like, yo, look at all the beautiful technology that's available to us. We got iPhones, we got iPads, we got fucking cars that run off electricity. Life must be great, right? Nah, man, we're fucking measuring the wrong shit, right? We're not even fucking focusing on the real desired goal. The real desired goal here is to overcome human nature because as fucking long as this human nature is in place as writ right now, right? The same barbaric, hierarchical, fucking warmongering, ethno fucking nationalistic human nature that we have right now, as long as that current nature remains in place, it doesn't matter how fucking far along we become technologically advanced, we are never going to overcome this fucking panorama of stupidity and suffering. And that's, that's the point that he's trying to fucking get to. Now, obviously, the only way that we can overcome this fucking animalistic human nature is to admit that we fucking have this base level animalistic human nature in the first place and then and then work to overcome it the problem is going to be then in realizing a how much work it takes to overcome it and b that many people don't want to fucking overcome it because of 
how much fucking work it takes to overcome it. I see this happening right now, especially uh, with a lot of the identity politics shit. People like, I'll speak just specifically about the brown community, right? But they've latched onto this identity politics shit and they realize, oh shit, like this identity politics, it actually helps relieve much of the suffering that I as an individual am going through just by virtue of the color of my skin. So if I can just latch myself onto this ideology, I don't have to worry about developing myself as a character in any way, shape or form which is fucking terrible because realistically you realize that most of those people I can speak from experience, they have a lot of character flaws that they need to address. Right. And a lot of flaws, most importantly, that are base level and animalistic, which means that if those very people were to ascend to positions of power, there is no fucking question that they would in turn turn around and do the exact same shit that was done to our communities, to the people that now they find themselves in the, in, in the minority class. Right. So realistically, what what changes? You know what I'm saying? This is the point that Nietzsche's trying to make, not necessarily with identity politics, but you can parlay it to there for sure, no doubt, right? So given the enormous amount of work inherent with such a venture, it, I, I mean, this is obviously a very fucking woke individual, this Nietzschean character, right? And he's going to flat out state like, you know what, man? This is a fucking tremendous responsibility for an individual to live one's life like a work of art. That's a tremendous fucking responsibility. It's a tremendous task. And most importantly, it's a tremendous reward. And it's one that many people, they're just not fitted for. So in that respect, this Nietzschean character, going back to the elitism, but again, elitism for better, for worse, right? Uh, he's going to want to say like, man, my shit, I'm concerned only for the few, the quote unquote few, right? Who will actually understand me, an ideology, me being Nietzsche, right? It's an, it's, uh, it's an ideology that has undoubtedly, again, led him to be considered elitist, right? And perhaps again, rightfully so, because he's saying, you know what? Not everyone's going to get this philosophy. And for those of you who don't, that's cool. Go find something else. Go read fucking, I don't know, Plato. <laughs> I use Plato for two reasons. First of all, because fuck Plato and all of his pedophilic followers. And two, most importantly, because Nietzsche was also like, fuck Plato, but for other reasons. Okay. Anyways, um, when uh, I guess an important uh, a clap back, if you will, to the people who accuse Nietzsche of being uh, an elitist is that they simply don't understand what he's truly asking for. Right. And in turn, how many people would be willing to even do what he's asking for, right? And what is he asking for? Again, it's just this complete, a reevaluation of human values, bro. Just everything that we have been told that a human is, come fucking subject that shit to outright scrutiny and see, is this even fucking what a human is, what a human can be? Is this what the best version of a human is? All kinds of different questions that require a fucking obscene, obscene amount of work. my camera was dying again. Not again, I should say. This is a complete different issue with the camera. This one was a little bit more easy to fucking fix, right? Anyways, so it's from this, and I think this is a, this is a good place to end it off because the next section I'm going to get to is his attacks on systematic philosophy, which is a fucking section entirely on its own that I could spend the whole fucking podcast series discussing. But uh, for now, I'll just go ahead and end it with this because I'm even almost now at the, I believe, hour-long mark. Uh, the last idea here is just his views on the herd mentality, right? Uh, yeah, man, in fact, I, with the next podcast, I'm actually going to pick up with the herd mentality because the herd mentality, oh, it's one of my favorite ones in all Nietzschean philosophy, specifically through the example of drumroll zebras, right? For those of you who are in my class or have taken my class before, you know exactly what the fuck is up. For those of you who haven't, oh, I have a great story about zebras that I love to parlay through his Nietzschean philosophy that I cannot wait to share. But for now, I'll simply leave you with the ideas of Nietzsche and his uh, claims that, you know, uh, the herd mentality, we as humans, we're fucking pack animals. We're, you know, fucking descended from chimps, bro. Chimps still to this day, herd fucking pack troops, whatever the fuck you want to call them. They lead, they follow an alpha. Everybody else knows their fucking role and they abide by that role, right? Furthermore, there's safety in the herd. And that's where the whole fucking zebra example is going to come out to play. Uh, and the, you know, understandably, it, it, it's, it's understandable, I should say, why people would be attracted to a herd mentality in the first place, because safety from an evolutionary biological perspective survival is of most importance. And, you know, the herd, historically speaking, has always guaranteed survival. But living in a modern world, 
where most of these amenities that ne- are necessary for survival, such as food, shelter, uh, food, shelter, water, and clothing, are available to anybody who has the fucking scratch, the scrilla, the greenbacks to fucking purchase the food, water, shelter, safety. Right? You don't really need the herd mentality, the, the herd to keep you safe anymore. You know, notwithstanding the fact that maybe you might want friends or some shit. But aside from that, like, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? But the problem is then of what you're going to sacrifice in exchange for these friends. Like most of us want to say, yeah, I want friends because of the companionship and the company and the camaraderie, right? But you got to ask yourself, man, like what the fuck am I sacrificing for all the aforementioned? And unfortunately for many of us, I know definitely was the case for me is that you're basically sacrificing everything, bro. You're sacrificing who you really are as a person. You're sacrificing what you really believe in, what you truly value, what you want to do with your life. And in many instances, perhaps even your overall happiness and well-being. And for what? So that you won't be alone, so that you won't be left without friends, man. Fuck that shit. You know what I'm saying? We're going to come to realize that the herd is something of a of a leveling force, leveling in the sense that it basically fucking establishes a status quo and it forces everybody to adhere to that status quo out, out of fear of fucking coercion, out of fear of alienation, out of fear of isolation, all sorts of different reasons, right? And ultimately what that does then is it takes away, it removes from you the ability to once again live your life as this fucking work of art that he's talking about, right? So we got to try to, you know, it, 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 we got to try to avoid this herd mentality as much as possible. And I'll get deeper into it again with the next podcast, right? But for now, uh, I guess we, it's, uh, the last important thing to state in regards to the herd mentality is the importance of self-realization, right? And how they can both ultimately be analyzed in such a way to show how this Nietzschean character, how his main concern was to show how we as men can be more men, but like human, right? Humans, men and women, we can be more than what he simply refers to as this Darwinian beast, that we can overcome our animalistic fucking base level existence and transcend to a higher level order of existence that will open up to us all new different facets of reality that are not contingent upon a godlike entity because God is dead, God remains dead and we killed him, bitch, right? So yeah. We'll talk about that more on my next podcast, the next Grito. Definitely won't take three weeks to get it out to you, hopefully, right? Nah, I'll get it out to you a lot sooner than that. I don't want to say hopefully. That's just a bullshit-ass fucking way of me giving myself an excuse to not podcast, but fuck that. I'll get this whole fucking uh, series on Nietzsche out to you as quickly as possible. Um, Until then, I appreciate you sticking around through a little bit of the technical difficulties and uh, supporting the podcast. So until next time, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Peace.